off last week speaking about uh, the responsibilities of the evangelist. We were on A. Um, just to sum that up, I think we all came to the conclusion um, there is a lot of uh, discrepancies on uh, Titus <laughs> 1 uh, and verse 1 of Paul leaving Titus in uh, Crete to appoint elders. And some believe that it's only the evangelist's job to appoint elders. And what we looked at, first of all, was um, God appoints <coughs> elders through the qualifications. So as, as I thought about this week, I thought, well, any man should be able to read the qualifications and know whether he is able to to be a an elder if he has the qualifications and the desire then god has said yes you could be an elder then that man can approach the congregation and the reason i say that was because in the the few instances that we looked at um in Acts 14 and 23, Paul and Barnabas appointed elders. Um, and Barnabas was not an apostle of, of Jesus. He, he was an apostle in the sense, in that verse, that Antioch, the church at Antioch, sent him up. They, they commended him, didn't they? And the idea of putting on, uh, uh, laying on of hands, um, they weren't bestowing any miraculous power to him that is just a sign of of uh approval. What, the witch approval uh, yeah sign of approval it's like you know we talk sometimes together and then some of us do that put a hand on like jeremy's shoulder yeah it's a good idea you do that get that going get that idea going that's all it is and then um in in act six remember there the thought of benevolence, that was an important job. Just not everybody should be um, given the duty of, of seeking out those that need benevolence and, and the authority of that. But we see there that Paul gave that job to the brethren to pick seven men. Okay, And then um, we just, I just thought... Uh, the other thought was, like, as Gord said, some say, well, elders should pick elders. Well, as Gord said, who picks the first elder? <laughs> it doesn't work, doesn't make sense that way. So um, just with those thoughts, we see where um, it is a joint decision with the church. If a man has the qualifications, then the men sit down and discuss that. And, and ask the, the reasons for that feeling, too. Yeah. And I think, I think perhaps we come away with um, the idea is in a church without elders, the evangelist is a teacher. Right. And so if anyone is going to take a, I wouldn't say a lead, but a more, yep. a more um, uh, public role in doing that, right. it's going to be the evangelist because... The evangelist is going to teach the congregation. All right, this is what we're looking for. Right. And I don't think I, I, I don't think it should be a dis, a, a decision just of the men of the congregation because I think the women need to be involved in. Oh yes, yeah. Because they're part of the congregation, so it's not like a, a men's meeting. Okay, we're going to select X, Y, and Z. I, yeah. I think, like I said, every congregation does it differently. I don't think you're wanting to get into that right yeah. now, but but there are some better ways and not better ways to do it and but i think the entire congregation should be involved and i think where we come down is who does who makes it's almost like who makes the announcement 
Is right. it going to be the evangelist or is it going to be somebody else? Right. And I think that's where a lot of people are coming coming down on saying, mm -hmm. okay, someone's got to make the announcement. And from <coughs> scripture, it always seems to be an evangelist who does it. Right. That's, I think, where people are coming down. But I don't believe that the, the evangelist should be picking the elders on his own. Right. That's right. Yeah. And I don't think Titus the, did that either. No, and the thought of, of the women being on there, well, in Acts 6, it was the brethren. Yeah. It's not spec specified only yeah. the men, it's the brethren of that congregation. And, you know, just my own thought is, too, if, if this, if God had only wanted the evangelist, I would think, wouldn't there be a direct command somewhere that's well, saying that, Jeff? I think one of the things that doesn't immediately come to mind is we forget the Christians then didn't have the New Testament right. to examine in the first place. Uh, exactly. So this letter was being written to Titus at the time, and he's the one being told by Paul what the false tables are. Uh, so it seems quite natural that, uh, that he would be, again, as the teacher, but as the one who's given these qualifications, the same as Timothy. Right. Uh, Paul had wrote these, and now they have those qualifications given through the Holy Spirit. Obviously, it's, it's logical they'd be the one to, uh, to take the lead in that. Right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And and it is good to remember everything we read. That these are all new congregations. Um, they're not like us. Maybe there's people who have been in the church 30 years, 40 years, um, that understand and, and can help and aid. I think, I think, just playing devil's advocate, I think people, if they want to run to the evangelist, will turn to Titus 1, when it, the evangelist was to appoint elders. But, like I said, I think that's what is, that's the command. Right. I, I, but I think it's in the context of everything yes. that, that we come away, no, no, the letter was written to Titus. And right. And so, he, yeah, he received the command, but not because he was just the evangelist, R it's because someone had to teach these people. Exactly. And, oh, Carla? So in Acts 6, when they cho chose the seven, uh, these were not elders. They, they, they oh. were just trying to um, lessen the work of the preacher because that's not his job to serve tables. But, the word of God needs to be preached, and that's what a preacher does. So I'm just asking, this is the seven people they elected. They were not elders. They were just men yeah. to help out but, in serving tables to the Grecian groups. Right, right. Yeah. And, and they were being chosen for an important position, too. Not an elder, maybe, but as I say, benevolence. And some, um, some leave the benevolence only to the elders, which we see is is not necessary. Um, but no, those are all good points. And as we said, some. Um, well, we discussed that later, so I won't get back into that. But uh, our next passage, and Jer's kind of covered this already, but uh, in Titus 1, 10 to, to 16, we see there um, maybe t take th three verses each. We don't, we've really read all that, haven't we? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah just kind of scan that, and, and what... Do, what comes to your head as far as the responsibility of the evangelist in, in that passage? Chair kind of just said it all. Well, Who I, is I, I, guess, I guess maybe I took the, this section to be talking to elders, but I, I'm not saying the evangelist can't can't do these things as far as as far as uh, you got you got to take care of those who are teaching false doctrine and we've got to like as far as rebuke those who are rebuke those who aren't sound in the faith and, and bring them back to the faith uh, right that's true it's kind of a maybe an overlap yeah. between the elders and the evangelists but we certainly know through our study in Timothy oh, yeah. That that is oh, the yeah. job of the evangelist yeah. um, to to expose uh, false teachers. Um, maybe 
as we said last week, when it comes to the point that um, they're beyond listening and discipline must be handed out, well, then the elders definitely need to, to be a part of that. Um, when it comes to the part, remember where we read that their mouths must be stopped, that to me is to the point where this is the last straw, the last draw, if you will. Um, so discipline must be uh, applied. And then um, your elders are certainly uh, qualified to do that. But on the other hand, if there is an elders, then that is the evangelist again and the man. Um, you know, we just, I think in a young congregation, you just can't let rampant things run rampant, you know. Jeff? It really reminds me of Timothy, the books of Timothy and now Titus, that elders, uh, <coughs> evangelists, and really all Christians uh, remind me of Ezekiel chapter 3, the teaching of the watchman. Right. They're to watch. And if someone is sinning, they should be warned. If they're not warned, then we're as guilty as they are. Right. If someone is doing wrong, you know, we say nothing. Uh, they'll be accountable for their sin, or we'll be accountable also. Uh, but the watchman who speaks up and says something, uh, if the sinner stops, we good. But if not, uh, only he will be accountable. Uh, the person I'm warned has uh, done what is right. Right. Exactly. That's really what these warnings sound like. Yeah. And it just speaks of, <coughs> doesn't it speak of our desire for our fellow brother or sister or our fellow man? We're all trying to reap the same reward. You know, um, if, if we overlook it, it just brings up the thought. We overlook it and say, ah, oh, that's Jeremy's job. <laughs> What's that say of us? You know, um, that's a good point. And then uh, Titus 2, 1 to uh, 6 and 9 and 10. Again, it's the thought of the evangelist correcting the morale and the doctrinal deficiencies that are present among the members. Again, it's all of these, I think, just fit into the category of teaching. That's his job to, to teach. Um, it's also our job to study and learn, but, but that is the job of the evangelist. And uh, verse 15, chapter 2 and verse 15, Maybe we'll uh, read that one, because that one, if that's the one, yes. Um, verse 15 reads, uh, I'm in the American Standard. Um, These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. No one is to disregard you. Um, what comes to your mind there? as far as the evangelist goes. Think of his thinking. Think of his feelings. Can you pick? He's got to encourage, right? Through that verse. Um, and exhorting brings to mind rebuking. But what does he need to be aware of? Can you think? Well, what? I was sort of thinking the congregation needs to accept the exhortations and the rebuke. Like I said, let no one despise you. Well, I can't force a congregation not to despise you, but no. that's part of what I need to, to get across is these words are for your benefit. Right. I'm not attacking you because I hate you. Right. I'm, I'm attacking sin because I want us all to be corrected. Right. Or ex exhorted. Like I said, we can't just exhort one another if there's correction. 
And we can't just always be correcting one another uh, without exhortation. Right. You need both. Right. But how can the how can grumbling and complaining affect you? That's kind of the point I thought. Um, you really can't care what people think. People aren't happy um, because we're affected by that. I think in our workplaces, everything. As soon as somebody disagrees with you, uh, almost instantly you're like, you got to think this out. Um, and a lot of times we're challenged with, okay, we'll go along with this person. Um, but when it comes to the evangelist, when it comes to Christianity, wow, we can't, we can't do that. We, we can't think that. Well, the evangelist needs to conduct himself worthy of respect. So you can't just be wishy-washy and even when it's nice, you know, see and you got to be, you know, firm all the time and, and people will respect you for that. Right. Um, so it, it depends on how you conduct yourselves too because there are lots of evangelists Oh yes. They just want to be nice, nice, nice to the people, and you know, like don't want to ruffle feathers or, or or approach things that are it's too dangerous ground to tread on, just because you just want to maintain this friendship, which is not the case. How evangelists should be. Right, Carla. Right, exactly. That, that, that's all. And I said, this is why Titus needed to be reminded of this, because it all is easier said than done. Right. Because it is tough when you're attacked, or maybe not attacked, but brethren treat you poorly, uh, and, and, or or don't seem to want to listen, or you have to, like I said, it's discouraging from time to time. And everyone goes through that. It doesn't matter what's it, it, any job. Right. Or any or anything we do, there will be times when we're discouraged and depressed and other things. But that's why we always need to be reminded of of how we should act. Because if we get down into those lows, God's the way out of those. Uh, and we need to remember: okay, this is my role. People may hate me. If they hate me, right. it's not really me they're hating. They're hating the instruction from God. And like as far as that's what. That's what uh, Jesus had said. They will hate you, but they really don't hate you. They hate me. Right. And and, and so that's uh, that's something that easier said than done, but it does need to be reminded. Exactly. It, it's a challenge for Christians, I think, because the basis of our belief is kindness, and we're trying to reach others. So, But there's times when... I guess when I was a young guy, you always heard stepping on toes. That was the saying. There's times that we have to step on a toe. But having said that, too, there's there's lots of ways that we can learn um, to be tactful. You know, there's lots of ways to approach situations and not turn somebody off instantly to the point where they won't listen, um, you know, we can, but still that doesn't mean avoid the truth, but there's different ways to working towards that and to have your friend or your neighbor or whatever continue to listen to you and listen to your reasoning, you know, so it's good for us to remember that. And then the last passage, uh, Titus 3, 1 to 8, um, again, it's just a repeat, um, the evangelist needs to constantly remind the members of the, of the proper manner in which Christians should act uh, in view of the salvation which God has offered to us. Um, you know, there's lots of times... Um, Sometimes I'll stop myself short and go, wait a minute, um, Christ died for me. He died for all of us, but when you make it personal, um, he died for me and I'm thinking this way. 
you know, that's not, uh, that's not the proper manner. Um, and it's good um, for us to remind ourselves constantly of what God has offered. Um, you know, that's why I believe God set it in order that we remember Christ each first day of the week to begin our week in that way. I, I think when you look at Titus 3, uh, talking about being subject to rulers and authorities, speak evil of no one, uh, we don't do this to earn anything. No. Uh, because and that's what Paul makes the point here. We were, we were like this at one time. Christ died for us. We received grace, the renewing of our minds, the, the Holy Spirit. We received that. So why do we act this way? It's because of what God did for us. Uh, a Christian will act this way. Yeah. Uh, like as far as if we are if we are uh, truly a Christian, this is the way we're going to act. We're going to follow after what God says. Right. It, it, it's it, it, if we're not following after what God says, we're not walking the life of a Christian. We may have been baptized, but we're not walking the life of a Christian. And so the, this entire letter uh, to Crete, the, these people, not just in the church, but in Cretans in general, right. didn't behave like this. They needed to be reminded, you were like that. You aren't to be like that anymore. Right. And lots, maybe we're still like that yeah. from what we read there. Titus certainly had his handful. Um, but having what Jared just said kind of moves us nicely into our next session, uh, section, and uh, that is good works. Okay, that's, you know, when I come to that section, I, oh, okay, well, we're being Christians along now, we're obeying God, we're doing what he's asked, oh, there's more I need to do. There's the good works. And the good works um, certainly describe more than uh, being obedient to the, the laws that God's commanded. Good works now all of a sudden brings in each other, um, our responsibilities to others. And uh, Dave asks us then, uh, how does Paul describe the relationship between the grace of God and the good works of man in the following passages. And so uh, our first passage, uh, Titus 2, 11 to 14. Um, maybe, Gord, I'll get you to, can you read two verses and then I'll give Kala the remaining? For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly thus we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Looking for the blessed hope for the glorious of heaven, of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem redeem that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Okay. In that passage, then, um, we understand we're to be a pattern of, of good works. Okay, we understand that. Um, but what do we read there that should motivate us? What helps to motivate us? Do you see there? Right, Jeff. Yeah. And the second coming of Christ. Exactly. And the fact in verse 14 that says he redeemed us. So that brings to our minds um, the cross, doesn't it? That's how he redeemed us. Someone um, sinless had to pay the price. That was the Father's um, desire. Someone had to shed his blood. And that, of course, was Christ. So that really 
when we're challenged with doing good works, um, we need to think of that. I would never even be in this position, you know. Um, kind of goes with Jer's thought earlier. None of us would be in this position if Christ hadn't died for us. Uh, no matter how uh, good we are, uh, no matter how loving we are, um, if Christ hadn't died, we would not be at God's side, would we? Um, we would not be forgiven. Um, so the thought there is uh, we need to remind ourselves of that. Think of that and, and motivate ourselves to, to good works, which could be anything as far as good works goes. Doesn't necessarily have to be teaching, could be helping out. Um, do you have your. Uh, hand? No, I was just thinking that we, we got to move in a way that a, like the beauty of the Lord be seen in us. And even when we are dealing with people, the Bible also says, let your speech be with great season with salt. Not just flare up and, you know, like, so the way we conduct ourselves, which is here so many living godliness, it, the beauty of the Lord should be seen in you and you should make a difference, really. Right. To everyone that you come in contact with. Exactly. Yeah. And people see that. People... People don't miss uh, even small acts of kindness because it's not normal. <laughs> it's not the way that society operates, you know. Um, I've seen it and, and even been told, you know, when you do some little act as a Christian, the one you're doing it to, they're like, oh, that's unusual, <laughs> you know. Because it is, it's uh, it's far and in between, I guess is the saying. But for us, as Kyle has said, no, we should be looking for that opportunity, which goes with our next passage uh, in chapter three, three to uh, verses three to eight. Um, I guess we could. We can read that one then. Um, Jeff, I'll start with you, and then I'll come over to Manchi. Um, maybe read two verses each. For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, Okay, um, Benchy, you read uh, 5 and 6? Not by works done in righteousness, which we did ourselves, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the waste washing of regeneration and renewing of our of the Holy Spirit, which we poured out upon us, which we, through Jesus Christ, saved our sin. Okay, Carmelita. Then having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. Okay. So what do we... What do we take from those verses uh, as far as good works go, um, and as far as our our attitude, I guess I could say? Well, we, we, we were not always Christians. <laughs> we were like the world, doing all sorts of things that we not not ought to do. Right. So, so we have to remember that when trying to deal with prospects, that we got to be patient and kind and understanding and long-suffering because we were one of them. Yeah, exactly. Carl said, used to say, treat them like prospects, not suspects. The which court? 
Treatment like yeah, prospects, no, no, no. It not suspects. Oh. Like prospects, not suspects. Yeah. So it's exactly. Um, and I had that thought this week. We're we're not to be <coughs> detectives. We just teach. Um, you know, we need to be careful with that type of attitude. Um, but. We also need to be ready and always looking, shouldn't we, really, for opportunities? You know, that's, that's maybe because I'm getting older, I challenge myself with that um, type of thought. Uh, am I looking for opportunities or am I waiting for them to come to me? Um, you know, because when I think of that, there's often not a lot of opportunity to teach someone or challenge them that's going to just come to me. <laughs> you've got to, you know, you've, you've got to stir it up, stir the sod up, don't we? Um, and not in a way, you know, where you're condemning the person right away, as we said, but watch for an opportunity to... Tell them what you think, what you believe, um, and then that will get them thinking. And and hopefully, maybe you'll even get a, you know, a reply. Oh, you know, tell me more type sauce. Um, but that's what I see. We need to be looking for opportunities um, to maintain good works and really to to meet urgent needs. Uh, Jeff, and then Paul. When I, I read this, I'm reminded what is the purpose of the organization and the structure of the church? Right. What's the purpose of every Christian having their place, the older, the younger, the men, the women? Uh, why are we given all these certain roles and responsibilities? Well, in this short little book, Good Works mm -hmm. mentioned six times. Yes. Quite a lot in one page, six times. Uh, chapter 1, verse 16, is the ones who won't follow the pattern that God has given, who are disobedient. They're disqualified for every good work. Works that, that may seem to be good in the eyes of men, disqualified for good works in the eyes of God. But chapter 3, verse 1, that reminds us those who are servants of God, those right. who are unprofitable servants, those who obey the authority they're under. And Christ has all authority. Those are the ones who are prepared, ready for every good work. It doesn't matter how good the work looks in the eyes of people. It's disqualified. It's not by the word of God. Right. Good point. I didn't want to read all them six verses because I didn't know if it would overlap in what Dave had laid out. Um, but that's true. In that book of Titus, six times, Paul is is impressing that upon us um you know Carl? so sometimes we meet people and they're not just automatically going to say yeah i want a bible study <coughs> and all of that they oh. may approach you in a way that they are in need and if we say well go your merry way be well fed shut up your bowels of compassion you got to take care of the need first yes and sometimes People may have this attitude, that's not my problem. They have the church, they have other people. I did enough already. I used to do this, 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 this. No, that's not the attitude we should have. When the opportunity presents itself, we should take it and do what we should do. Yeah. And then it would lead to other things. Exactly, yeah. Um, that comes out in our next study. Uh, Philemon. Um, it's, I found it interesting that right after Titus comes Philemon. Um, but that's the thought of good works. Um, you know, we, we can't just center our minds on, well, I shouldn't say obeying God, but um, maybe we get the mindset where, okay, we're doing as God said, but then we set the good deeds 
aside a little bit where, you know, we can make excuses um, helping others. We can, in this society here anyway, it might be weaning a little bit as time goes on, but, but we can say, well, our system can help that person. Our government can do this, can do that. Well, maybe so, but what is our responsibility? Uh, I think that's why Paul told Titus to tell him to be careful to maintain. Yes. Because it's so easy to not, to say it is someone else's problem. <laughs> that, that, or someone else can do it, or I don't have the ability to do anything. We usually have the ability to do something. Yes. We may not be have the ability to do everything, but but careful to maintain means to continue. You got it, it's not a, okay. I've done my part now. That's done. Yeah. No more. Uh, uh, or it's a, sort of like a, a quota we have for, for good works. Okay, I've done my quota for the year. I'll have to wait. I'll, I'll wait till next year. Or oh, I've done my quota for the month. I'll wait till next month. Like where. We may need to maintain it. We got to be careful to do that. Yeah, we need to constantly remind ourselves, don't we? Well, that uh, ends uh, Titus. There's our outline, of course. Uh, Paul's introduction of the letter, and then in verse five of <coughs> chapter one, we move into the need for sound doctrine in the church. And then uh, the need for sound doctrine in the lives of the members of us. And then in chapter 3, the need for sound doctrine to be maintained. You know, so that reminds us that's a constant working, isn't it? To maintain that. And then the conclusion of the letter. But just like what Jeff had said about good works, sound doctrine appears, uh, and I think they go hand in hand. Yes. Uh, sound doctrine appears <coughs> so many times in this book that we, we talk about, I think I heard someone say one time, well, I don't read of a sound church in Scripture, like as far as that, that phrase, sound church, mm. has nothing to do with there isn't a sound church, but where do we get this idea? Well, it's from sound doctrine, a sound church we following and teaching sound doctrine and and so uh, they will be involved in good works all of that goes hand in hand sound doctrine and good works that's part of sound doctrine right you you you, you find that the churches in revelation when we get there the church at sardis being dead well they didn't know they were dead right. they thought they had a reputation as being alive but were dead one of the reasons may be, possibly, that they were not uh, participating in good works. They might have been worshiping the proper way, following the proper doctrines, but not for, not they were dead because they weren't living the life of Christians. Possibility. Right. I'm no, trying I'm to get you to that bell. I'm not ashamed to hold my Lord, nor to defend.